speak to our speak our four speakers, um, mostly because of what they're going to be doing is telling you a little bit about the path that they've taken and and kind of the different roles that they've served in. And so I'm going to I'm leaving that to them. Afterwards, we're going to have each of them having a few minutes to kind of answer kind of an introductory question related to their their career path, and then um, maybe a follow up question, but then really dive into having an opportunity for the, the audience to interact with our panelists and ask them questions. I have plenty of questions to fill the hour, but I would love the, the students and staff and faculty that are on to also jump in with questions as we go. And so certainly when we get to that point, feel free to, to raise your hand to be able to ask the question directly or to put them in the chat and then we can, we can monitor that, that as well. But thank you so much for our panelists for joining. We have um, four panelists here. We have Michael Merson, who's the Professor Emeritus of Medicine and Professor of Global Health at Duke. Um, he's also the founding director of the Duke Global Institute, and so um, certainly has a strong history with, with Duke and ties to, to the to health policy within, within Duke and more globally. Susan Denser then is President and Chief Executive Officer at, at the America's um, Physicians Group, and she was previously actually a senior policy fellow here at Duke Margolis, and actually currently serves on our advisory board. And then Dan Kimberg is the Director of Strategy and Operations for the North Carolina Integrated Care for Kids. Um, he's a graduate of Duke, and what I like about Dan is every time I hear him speak, I think I should quit my job and, and go help him achieve his goals. He's he always is very inspiring in terms of wanting to change the world. And then Lisa Bourget is the Senior Director of Strategy Management and, and Partnerships for both the Duke Global Health Innovation Center and Innovations in Healthcare within DGHI. Um, she's also a Duke graduate with her MBA coming from Fuqua. So lots of experiences both here at Duke and, and outside. And so what we wanted to start is just having each of our panelists, and I'll start with um, Michael Merson, telling us about your current role within health policy and the path that you've taken to reach your position. Um, and go ahead, Mike. Thanks, Jillian, and hello to uh, everyone. Um, nice to be with you. Uh, briefly, um, my most of my current work uh, unexpectedly in some ways is related to what we've all lived through in the last few years with COVID. Uh, and now thinking more about the future of pandemic uh, preparedness and response. Uh, I've been involved with a lot with the Margolis and the Duke Global Health Institute and with Lisa's Center on um, a program one COVID gap dealing with accountability um, of donors and of, and of uh, agencies, a program called Quick Start, which is involved in a rollout of Paxlovid in 15 African countries, um, and uh, most recently in a new initiative that um, Mark McClellan is very much involved in on trust in public health, which is a, a, a really important issue right now. I'm also, uh, for the past few years, had an interesting experience of being one of the advisors to the National Basketball Association on, on COVID, and that's obviously involved in a lot of policy issues in the field of sports and, and public health. Uh, Julian, how did I get here? Uh, I've been around in many years, so I'll make it brief. Um, just tell you in my path what I think has been most important. Uh, one was that I, um, one was that I uh, um, started early on in my career after going into medicine, I was two years at the CDC. Uh, as an epidemiology intelligence officer, where I learned a lot about, appreciated coming out of medical school, the importance of looking at populations rather than individuals. I think that was a key, a key point in my early life. Uh, I then, as I often tell students uh, to do, went abroad for a few years, short term in, in Nepal and in Northeast Brazil, but uh, three years in Bangladesh, um, working uh, in various ways, which really broadened and created my great interest in global health. Um, then uh, rather unexpectedly went to the World Health Organization in Geneva for two years in stage 17. Uh, there, there goes planning. And um, in that sense, in Geneva, I was privileged to run three global programs, 
Um, two of them changing the treatment paradigms, one for diarrheal disease in kids and the other for pneumonia in kids. I can say more about those if you want. And then uh, for five years, ran the global program on AIDS. I had 500 people working for me in about 140 countries where we really had to deal with the, at a time in the AIDS pandemic when AIDS, this is now the 10th, 10th to 15th year of the AIDS pandemic where AIDS was really increasing quickly. Uh, the first 10 years being mostly HIV. And so I worked a lot with many countries, many donors, uh, many agencies on policies around AIDS, prim primarily in the practice domain. And then uh, I spent two years finally setting up UN AIDS, which was working with almost the entire UN system and creating a, a program that was made up of six agencies, the first co-sponsored program of six UN agencies in the UN, now it has 10. And that certainly taught me a lot about um, the uh, multilateral system and, and the United Nations. And then in my last um, 30 years, I've been in academia uh, at Yale as a dean of public health school and at Duke running the Global Health Institute. And there, of course, I have, was privileged to be presented with many different um, activities and uh, um, initiatives where policy played a major role. So I've had a, a long path uh, and, and, and winding up really with a career that maybe started out in in research, but really became more and more practice oriented and policy oriented. Uh, would I have predicted that? No, uh, but that's another that we will probably cover that later in the in our webinar. Great. Thank you. Um, Susan, I'm going to jump in next. Great. Well, thank you, Jillian, and hello to everybody. Delighted to be with <laughs> such distinguished colleagues speaking with you today. So I think you're going to hear some common themes would be my bet. Um, and I'll start with what I think for me has been a definitive common theme. I think everybody probably knows or thinks they know the Robert Frost poem that ends with the two lines. Um, I shall, or four lines, I should say, I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference, right? Probably a lot of you read that poem and everybody re remembers those last two lines. I took the road less traveled by and that has made all the difference. If you actually read the whole poem, the rest of the poem is a setup that says, what you're about to hear in these last two lines is complete bunkum because the rest of the poem is all about this narrator coming to a point in the woods. He sees one road go this way, one road go the other way. They look about the same. He goes, oh, what the heck, I'll go this way. And because he went this way, and then he goes on to say, way leads on to way. So you go down this way, and then you get another fork in the road, and you go this way, and you get another fork in the road this way. So the whole poem is about the nonsense of looking back at your life and saying this one thing made all the difference and by the way it was the road less traveled by because the rest of them says it wasn't less traveled by the roads were the same right so the reason i start there is that as you heard from mike you know that is what a long career can end up being you know you come to a place in the road and something happens, there's AIDS, right? And you go this way, or there's COVID and you go this way. And that has been the story of my life. It Nothing was preordained or preplanned. And, and as I often say to, to younger people, most of what you'll end up doing in life doesn't exist when you're in college, right? It happens after that. Uh, and the environment changes and society changes and reality changes. So the best thing you can do in college or in graduate school is develop a basic set of interests and skill sets because dollars to donuts, you're going to end up applying them in ways you never thought would happen because you didn't because they didn't exist is often the answer. So what did I do? I 
got out of college, I went, I went to Dartmouth. I only get involved in schools that begin with D, like Dartmouth and Duke. I went to Dartmouth. I was an English major, hence I read Robert Frost. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had a background, a keen interest in public policy. I thought I might go get a law degree. I also really loved being an English major. I thought I might maybe go get a PhD and be an English literature professor. I had no idea what I wanted to do. But what I thought I would do is take a couple of years off and go into journalism because I had really enjoyed writing for the school paper at Dartmouth. So that's what I did. I went and got a job in journalism 28 years later. <laughs> having worked at um, the, some of the preeminent news magazines of the time, and then having gone to the PBS NewsHour to start a whole uh, program there on coverage of health policy, I then got recruited away to lead the journal Health Affairs. And I went and did that for five years, completely unexpected. I had the honor of publishing article by Mike Merson, articles by Mike Merson, among others, during that time there. I really enjoyed that, although um, after five years, I had basically concluded that the job was, no offense to the people on this call, taking very badly written articles by academics and making them slightly less bad <laughs> was basically the job. And I, that was tedious to me, even though I really enjoyed other aspects of the job. I didn't really want to do that anymore with my life. So I moved on. I then went, spent some time as a senior policy advisor for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, ran a nonprofit in Boston that was focused on healthcare innovation, ha had three wonderful years uh, affiliated with Duke Margolis, and then was recruited again to lead uh, America's physician groups. We now represent about 360 large physician groups around the country, uh, some of them household names that you know well. The, the major um, physician groups that are affiliated with the Kaiser system, for example, are our members. Uh, the, the physician groups associated with Mass, Mass General Brigham, uh, with Common Spirit, with Providence, et cetera, the, uh, those are all our members. And our, the common denominator among our members is that they are extremely focused on value-based care. Uh, they really want to get out of fee-for-service altogether, although the system is still largely to some degree frozen in fee-for-service. They want to get out. They want to provide care on a capitated, prospectively budgeted basis. Many of them do that. Um, either through their affiliations with uh, Medicare Advantage and very what are known as delegated relationships with those plans, or they're involved in some of the uh, demonstration uh, projects that have come out of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation since the Affordable Care Act, or they're involved in the Medicare Shared Savings Program, or they're trying to uh, strike value-based relationships with uh, commercial insurers, whatever the case, they're committed to value and being held accountable. And that's really our catchphrase. We aim to be accountable for the cost and quality of healthcare. So that's what I'm doing now is running that organization, helping uh, navigate us through a number of public policy issues as they arise and really try to spur the movement to value throughout the US healthcare system. So I'll stop there. Great. Um, thank you. Now, Dan, your turn. Great. Um, so nice to be with you all today. Were any of you at the Duke UNC game on Saturday night? You want to put up a little emoji or any any sign? Just okay. We'll see. I don't see anyone. I was gonna say so I wasn't there, but I was. A couple of people. <laughs> happy with the result. Yeah, it had been 16 years since I had last gone to a Duke UNC game in Cameron. That was my senior year of college. It was really nice to be back. My wife, who I was there with, um, who's a pediatrician and child psychiatrist at Duke, turned to me and said, doesn't John Shire just look like such an imposter right now? And um, I'm feeling a little of the imposter syndrome myself with this, these panelists who I'm talking alongside. Like, what a great treat to be here with you all. And I think most of the people on this call are undergrads and graduates, right, Jillian? I got that right. And maybe you all sometimes Correct. feel like imposters when you're in some spaces as you're thinking about big problems that you are inspired to try to solve. Um, so maybe we can relate on that. And with John Shire about our imposter syndrome. Um, I am the Director of Strategy and Operations at North Carolina Integrated Care for Kids. 
which means I spend every day thinking about how to improve health and well-being outcomes for children and change the systems around children to make the path to success as easy as possible. I think about health systems, but I also think about education, child welfare, juvenile justice, food, housing. Um, my journey to get here started when I was a college kid at Duke. Um, I had this great opportunity after my freshman year in college to teach fifth graders in English um, in New Orleans. And I based a six week curriculum all around Dr. King and his writing. We used all of his essays to really analyze um, punctuation and grammar and syntax. He uses so many run on sentences, y'all. So it's like the best, you take the letter from a Birmingham jail and you could like learn so much about run on sentences. So we focused six weeks on his writing. At the end of that summer experience, each of my students wrote his or her own I have a dream speech, then presented those speeches to an auditorium of 500 people. I was backstage just hysterically crying, like really, really crying. Um, two main reasons. One, I was just so inspired, so inspired by the brilliance of these fifth graders, just so inspired. And number two, I was so devastated because I knew enough, even as an 18 year old then, to know that there's so many systems around those fifth graders that were gonna get in the way of them actually sharing their brilliance with the world. So many systems that were gonna hold them back instead of propel them forward. Um, I came back with those feelings to Duke um, and started working with the Durham community to create and then launch Student U, uh, an organization meant to really protect and preserve the brilliance of students in the Durham Public Schools, um, which walks with students from sixth grade all the way through college on their journey with the message being, you are whole, you are full, the systems around you are broken, you have the ability to succeed and then change those systems. Um, I loved the work that I did with Student U. I loved the students and the families with whom I got the opportunity to work. Um, I, we did a lot of work with um, UNC School of Social Work and did a lot of analysis on those systems that I keep on talking about that were getting in the way of our own students being able to succeed. One year, we found out that 25% of our students moved two or more times the previous year. Can you just think about that for a second, y'all? 25% of our kids moved two or more times the previous year. Um, I was really struck. We had spent a lot of time thinking about the education system and some of its strengths and some of its weaknesses and hadn't really understood the force of housing and the systemic racism that underpins housing that gets in the way of children having the stable housing that they deserve. We hadn't really thought about that. So I got really interested in housing. Um, I moved to New York and spent a few years uh, working with different cities around the country to reimagine their systems of housing um, with a focus on racial reconciliation and reparations and systemic reform and had a great, enjoyed a lot of like in, important conversations and great progress in Austin and in Louisville and other cities around the country thinking about reforming housing systems. Um, while I was there, I'm adding this part because I want you to hear that maybe um, a lot of the imposterness inside of me I uh, grew up Jewish and went to Union Theological Seminary in New York City to study childhood ethics and to really try to understand as much as possible the current underneath systems that exist in North Carolina and felt like I needed to understand religion in order to understand that. Uh, so I focused on ethics and childhood and how we as a society can create better systems for children. Came back to North Carolina to work at North Carolina Integrated Care for Kids, where I am now hopefully um, holding on to the brilliance of those kids in New Orleans and the students that I worked with throughout Student U and trying to build some better systems for them um, and their families. Really glad to be with you all today. Thank you. And then Lisa. Well, those are three hard acts to follow. <laughs> I, I was just sitting here thinking I was probably 30 years ago when I started my career, the least likely to be on a career panel about health policy. But again, that's probably the point that Susan, um, well, Mike and 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 um, others have made and will make. So um, I am a senior director um, and help co-lead um, the Duke Global Health Innovation Center and Innovations in Healthcare. Um, and I guess I'm gonna start I'm going to sort of move, I'm going to go back 30 years and just say that um, I graduated from Tufts. I was pre-med uh, with an econ degree um, and knew I wanted to do something in international relations and health. 
I didn't know my job existed 30 years ago, but I'm sure glad that I that I found it. Um, I spent um, really most of my 25 years or so before joining Duke um, in healthcare. Uh, I worked um, uh, for several startup companies, took one public, um, have always been sort of interested in disruptive innovation, um, particularly in healthcare. Um, and then had the opportunity to work for uh, a couple of providers, managing physician practices, managing billing. Um, I worked for a payer for a few years and, and also spent some time at Accenture in their um, healthcare consulting practice. Um, and so I, uh, right before I came to Duke, I was in uh, biotech and also had the opportunity to sort of understand product development and sort of the clinical research life cycle. Um, so when I came to Duke 10 years ago, I really never had done anything in health policy or, or academia. Um, and for the last, I would say several years, um, get to, um, I think, work with some amazing entrepreneurs and innovators around the world um, who, um, have uh, come up with an interesting um, either technical product or business innovation that helps improve health access quality and cost. Um, so I, I lead a team of about 20. Um, we have about 100 plus innovators around the world that we help support. Um, and we also run an academic center that, as Mike was mentioning earlier, that's also trying to um, be positive and, and create um, sort of enabling environments from a policy perspective, um, from a funding perspective to allow innovations to scale. Um, so um, I, yeah, I, I, I really, yeah, I think I'm blessed and incredibly grateful that I get to work with so many, um, not just smart, but um, risk takers, um, people who see that there's a, an opportunity to improve something and, you know, quit their full-time job, um, start a company, or um, even if they're uh, in a policy track, like see the virtue, see the value, see the evidence in something, in doing something different and realize that perhaps there needs to be policy um, innovations to support um, sort of an underlying innovation. So I guess I'll I'll leave it there just because um, I'm sure we want to get into some discussion. Thanks, Jillian. Yeah, thank you so much to all, each of you. Um, so we are going to now be able to have some questions. Um, I'll start off with the first one, but if anyone else wants to jump in with questions, just raise your hands or stick it in the chat and um, we can go from there. So the first one is just, and, and some of you have touched on this a little bit, thinking back to um, kind of your formal education, uh, how do you feel that your education either prepared you or didn't prepare you for your, your career path? Um, and so I'll let you guys um, jump in and, and, and answer whoever wants to dive in first. Jillian, I'll, I can start. Yeah. Um, I, I got a liberal arts education you know, which is the world's best preparation for everything else in life, right? Uh, and even though uh, I was a humanities major, and now as we know from the data, almost nobody is taking humanities courses in most of America's premier institutions, that is a real, real problem in my view, because humanities are about the study of being human beings. And, you know, guess what? That's what we still all are. So, I mean, you heard Dan talk about, you know, reading Martin Luther King's I have a dream speech right that's that that's not that's that's a humanities exercise there and so um I would say um liberal arts is the way to go and really have a basis of, of to to be able to and, and learn the you know the critical thinking skills right that's the basis of being able to move any place else in life so um, the advice I always give younger people is you go to a great liberal arts at school and take as many courses in as many disciplines as you possibly can, because you do not know where you're going to end up in life. If you had told me, as Lisa said, if you told me, no, Susan, you know, you're graduating today from Dartmouth, but you're going to be a health policy person 30 years from now, and you're going to devote your entire thinking to health policy, I would have said, what, what are you smoking? How can you even think this, right? 
So just having the ability to take your critical thinking skills and adapt as you go and tailor your interest to opportunities as they emerge, right? Um, the, the way to go in my view. Yes. Uh, Jillian, I would add to that. Um, I also went to, I went to Amherst College, also liberal arts. And I recently was back for my 50th anniversary. And um, I, had, I thought a lot about your question and I, and I think because you know, a fiftieth anniversary does that. And uh, what I will tell you is that I think Susan mentioned you you really learn how to think. For me, uh, at the time, everyone in Amherst had to take an English writing course. It was required, and I learned how to write. And I can't. I, I'm so grateful for that. It, when I thought back. It was how to think and how to write. Of course, they go together. Uh, but but I wanted to mention that the and also, of course, the fact that you at least now colleges have changed. But in those days, as Susan has said, you had to take courses, no matter what your major was, in, in uh, many other areas. And I think to appreciate particularly health policy being more than medicine, but really understanding the relationship of medicine and health to so many other fields. That was also for me a very important uh, influence in my thinking. Yeah, thought? I agree. I agree. Yeah, with both of those. I also went to Tufts and had a liberal arts education, but um, I would also say, you know, um, so much of what you're going to make in your career, you know, builds upon the foundation of the liberal arts education, but really builds upon your ability to build relationships and connect with people. And I, I actually think it's the things like, I don't know, um, like art history classes or music or, or things that um, have nothing to do with maybe why you're in the same room as somebody um, in, in a work situation. I think that that color or that, um, yeah, I think, being you and um, again, pushing yourself in your um, career to have interests outside of what you're doing and being able to parlay that into connections and relationships with people, I think is really what's, I think helped me um, back to Susan's point about like creating more um, unique roads for myself. Yeah, Jillian, I'm happy to share for a moment yeah. too. That's um, I will be a little bit more critical of one part of my education as a Duke grad. I'm feeling like leaning into that and feeling comfortable with that. Um, I took a lot of service learning courses throughout my time at Duke. I'm sure many of you are connected to different courses such as that. And there was a at least a hidden curriculum or an underlining assumption that as a Duke student, I had this power to save and serve children and families around me in the community and around Durham. And I think it's, it was really like a detrimental message. It made pe people and me included think that potentially children and families were broken, not the systems around them being broken. And I think that's like really pervasive and problematic in um, a world that um, has so much need for us to challenge. Um, Susan, you said before you're talking about accountability and accountable to, to value. And I'm gonna just link this. Um, I think a lot about like, to whom are we accountable? To whom are we most accountable? Is it to payers, to policymakers, uh, to actual individual people? Um, and I would say that some of the, uh, a curriculum that says that individuals are broken and need to be fixed lead to us not necessarily feeling the accountability in the right places. So we we'll talk a lot more about that, but I wanted to add that as well. Right. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to pause for a second, see if anyone on our that in the audience wants to jump in with a question. Welcome to raise your. Oh, someone raised their hand. Oh, sorry. Hey, thank you so much for um, being here. I really loved a lot of your introductions and some of the answers to the questions already presented. I just had a question, and this is directed to any of you uh, for presenting. Um, once you graduate college, so I'm personally a junior, and let's say you're starting in on your first job or you're starting in grad school, what is the biggest recommendation you have as to like, keeping your mind open to different opportunities and identifying which ones would help you develop your career and your interests further? 
Well, I'll, I'll to start, um, I want to pick up on Lisa's point because one thing she said really was, she didn't use this phrase, but she's talking about kind of soft skills and the soft skills that really do enable you to succeed in life are the ones she talked about. You know, forming relationships, uh, finding people to help mentor you, uh, re reaching out to people you would like to mentor you. You, you know, you, you shouldn't stalk prospective mentors, but you should, you know, try to connect with people who you think you can learn from uh, and who can help you uh, think about broadening your horizons. Uh, I think that's the most important thing. The other thing I think I would say is um, the, the best jobs that I ever had in life were the ones that I thought up myself. And you can't do that your whole career. But you can always do some of that. You can always be thinking, hmm, you know, I really have this ambition or, or I've really got this thing. I mean, you heard what Dan, you know, Dan clearly felt that when he was listening to his fifth graders, right? That that's where he was going to cast his lot in life. So coming up with sort of a sense of, you know, roughly what you want to do and then thinking about how you can create it. And as he said, uh, creating student you, that's essentially something that didn't exist, right? So I think you can always be alert to opportunities to go places and connect with people who will enable you to do something that you see, you know, needs to be in the world that isn't already there. And again, you can't always do that at every stage of your life. You know, the, the world is full of the littered corpses of entrepreneurs whose ideas failed and all of that stuff. But um, having that sense of, I can try to do something, I could try to build something for myself, and then following that, um, I think if you kind of can keep that spirit alive, even if you're moving from pre-existing job to pre-existing job, you'll have a much more fulfilling career and uh, and sense of purpose, which is really the number one thing. So I, I would just add to that. Um, I teach a lot of undergrads and, and graduate students. And so that I often get that question. And there's no easy answer. Uh, but I always say two things, uh, often say two things. One is try to figure out what your what your passion is and go with your passion. Now that's a big word and could mean a lot of things, but I'm thinking more of an, in this sense, an intellectual, spiritual, you can define it as you wish, but what do you really care about? And what do you wanna spend a lot of time doing in your life, in your career? Uh, for me, it was the early experiences abroad and un understanding what poverty meant to health and wanting to do something about that rather than treating individual patients uh in, in the hospital i mean but i mean everybody's different i don't mean to use my example but but and 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 that is not always easy and you know as susan said you may have to try a few things to figure it out but really trying to go with your passion because you'll be much happier in your in your work life if you're doing something that you're passionate about and secondly you're going to have a number of um positions and opportunities in your 60, 70 years of working or 50, 60 years of working. And you're never gonna figure out now what those are gonna be. But one thing that's related to passion is having a, a certain things you can offer that are unique, whether it be your knowledge or your personality or your your social, your social your, um, skills in music or art. I, I'm, I don't know much of you. I don't know any of your background, but having something that's unique uh, that's with you in your passion and so that you can go in different ways because as you heard from those who are on this panel we have gone in different ways often ways we didn't know we would go but are but we were um, given opportunities because of the knowledge and experience we had um gara three hi can you hear me okay Yes, great. Hi, my name is Guy Three. I'm an MPH student at BU, and I'm really grateful to be here and hear you all speak on your experiences. So one thing that it seems to me is a common trend in what you all have said is the um, kind of shift in healthcare to innovate and to make the system a little bit more affordable and accessible to the people that it serves. So my question to you then is, 
what is the biggest challenge that you think we as young upstart public health professionals might face in trying to make those changes to the system, whether it's through a financial lens or a social justice lens or whatever it is? Um, yeah, maybe I, I would say whether you're wanting to do that in the U.S. or abroad, I would say, you know, healthcare is, you know, I think unique compared to a lot of industries in that there are a lot of really, really, really good, what I would call point solutions or interventions that, that should be scaled, must be scaled, right? Have evidence, but, um, you know, like to give you a simple example, you know, if your app or your tech digital health thing doesn't integrate with Epic, you know, you're, you're up against your, your, the, the David and Goliath power imbalance, I think is, is, is a little more acute in healthcare than it might be in other industries where there isn't, you know, asymmetry of information, you can go more direct to consumer. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, that's not to say it doesn't happen. It, it, it does, but I think you just have to be a lot smarter and strategic about like what levers to pull when. Yeah. Uh, 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 oh, go ahead, Deb. Yeah. No, after you. Um, I, I guess I've evolved to thinking about um, healthcare. First of all, I never use the word system because there's nothing systematic about what we have. It's a big blob in the United States. So, and the problem with the healthcare blob, despite all the, despite the innovation, and there is a lot of it going on. And I think of the innovation as being, if you can imagine a birthday cake with a lot of bright candles burning, the candles are the innovation, but it sits on top of a cake that is rotten, rotten. And why is it rotten? Some of it is the structural uh, makeup of the system and frankly, a lot of fee-for-service payment that has driven toward volume and lack of accountability for cost and quality. That's one major feature of the US healthcare blog. Okay, another major feature is, you know, we all know, right, we do almost nothing to address the upstream drivers of health, the social determinants of health. We basically still wait till people get sick and then we throw them into the most expensive system in the world, the blob, and expect that good will come of it, right? And we do very, very little as a country to address those upstream drivers and the inequities in the system, right? Until people get sick and end up in the expensive blob. And if you sort of roll all those things together, and then there are others, but those are the main ones, you know, any kind of innovation is going to be bright candles on a rotting cake until we do more to address th those other more fundamental issues, one of which is, I say, is truly holding the system accountable. And I, by accountable, ultimately, that does, who is most accountable? People, right? We should be accountable to people, people who are patients, people who might be future patients if we don't address the underlying conditions in which they live. You know, that's who the system ultimately has to be accountable to. And by the way, they are also going to be taxpayers funding the system and premium payers paying insurance companies. So that's what the system, the blob is only marginally held accountable for. Uh, so I think, what are you up against? All of that, all of that. It doesn't mean, I don't say any of this to deter any of us, right? We have to do this work. Uh, and and alter the system as best as we can from our individual uh, perspectives, but um, it's going to it's taking way more than a village, right, to get all this done. And but it is still, I think, a rewarding career. You just have to set your sights on being a, a small agent of long term change. Dan. I really like that answer, Susan. I appreciate the cake metaphor and those candles. Um, I love this question. I'm going to share two quick thoughts that I have, okay? First is um, these challenges. First challenge, we have this real, I think, obsession 
not just in health policy, but everywhere on short term return on investments, right? How do you invest something today and get something back that's better tomorrow? And when you're thinking about the complex blob, Susan, that you described, um, there it will take a long time to see a return on short term investments meant at improving that blob. And I think that sometimes another problem within that mindset is that we want the return on the investment to come in the same silo as the investment that was originally made. A healthcare investment in the short term might actually create a return on the investment for society or in a juvenile justice department or for early child, right? It's like, and that doesn't mean that the same investors of healthcare are going to get that. And I think there's like a real flaw, like this wrong pocket problem. I think it's really interesting. Okay. Second thing I want to say, I care a lot about children. That's what I spend my career thinking about. So this is a child's focus answer. I think a real challenge that we often have is that we are thinking about children as future payers, future voters, future humans, future adults, future people. And so we build policies thinking about what will they be like when they grow up. And they're like whole humans right now and worthy of dignity and love and support. And I think we we kind of forget sometimes when we're thinking about child policy that they're not just it's not just about who they're going to be when they grow up, like they're already humans and worthy of, of our time and effort. So two things that come to mind with a really good question. Great, thank you. Um, so there is a question in the chat about um, kind of how you are advised personally by researchers and how valuable you find having a research background policy. Uh, Julian, I would say on that, that there's no doubt that having a research background can be helpful. Uh, no question, learning, uh, knowing and doing research uh, is important, <clears throat> particularly interpreting the results, because those results very often <clears throat> should be impacting policy. And so I would certainly not discourage anyone in a research career uh, to think about how that can impact on policy. In fact, I would encourage that they do research bearing in mind the possibility that it could impact on policy and even designing the study if they can so that it can act on policy. Having said that, um, I, I just wanna give a little bit of the flip side, which is that I, I, I think having a broader background than research is important to be able to know uh, as, be as best as one can uh, the relevance of, of research findings to, pol to policy uh, on an issue. Um, I find that sometimes uh, researchers are very um, dedicated to the work they've done, the findings they've had, uh, and need to realize that there could be other ways in, uh, of looking at, a, at an issue uh, and um, besides their own. Uh, and so it's very valuable to me when researchers have had in their background, in their experiences, some reality testing, working in the field or uh, being involved in having at an early age, to, uh, involved in some policy work, even in the classroom, so they can appreciate uh, how research can best be used. I, I just want to second everything Mike just said. Um, when I was uh, editing health affairs, a phrase that I banned from the publication was more research is needed because <laughs> every article that I ever was ever submitted to us said in the last, in conclusion, more research is needed. More research is always needed. All right. So that's why I banned it. But the second thing is we always ask authors to conclude an article in health affairs by saying what the policy implications were of their work. And many of them would say, oh, well, I can't say that. I, I, I don't know, that's way beyond my ken. Well, then why are you writing for a health policy journal, right? And you may be wrong <laughs> about your conclusions about the implications, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to go into the research with that framing and come out with that framing. Um, and so the research, the, the methodology, that training, that science is incredibly, incredibly important, but amen to what Mike said. You have to marry that with what are the implications for the real world? Because particularly if your area is health policy, what, what, what else is the point, right? But trying to 
reason from the research to what should be done from a policy perspective? Um, one more quick question from the chat and then I'll get to you, Jean and Rachel. So there was a question um, from a senior who has switched from thinking about going to medical school to switch to going into business and is, is wondering about how important it is for her um, to continue with their clinical experience to be able to make a large impact. And so really that kind of the, the clinical side of things, if you're going to be trying to impact health policy. And I guess, Mike, you might be the only MD in this group, right? Uh, right. And I, I would say that um, I, I think having clinical experience is valuable. I wouldn't discourage it. I don't think it's nece necessary. Uh, many people that are very sound um, policy thinkers and doers uh, have not had clinical experience. Um, I, 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 I don't want to sound negative to that. Um, um, I, I, I do mean, I think if you have it, it's fine, but it's not, I don't think it's required. And I'm sure Jillian yourself, knowing your background, uh, there, you, you know, plenty of people that have been <clears throat> involved in policy that haven't had clinical experience. Uh, and, um, I actually think one of the challenges we have had in health policy and Susan, now you may have seen this at the journal, but uh, is is uh, having a collaborative relationship with the private sector. Uh, public health doesn't have a great history here. Uh, and I work globally, and certainly the World Health Organization doesn't have a great history here. So I, I just want to say that I'm, I'm, I think it's wonderful for people should not be discouraged by going into the private sector. They are very critical in getting sound public health policy um, and, you know, obviously we get into the issue of the profit motive, but I, I think we, we need to deal with that in the right way. Yeah. Right. Can I also add yeah. that actually was sort of me. I mean, I thought I was going to go to med school and become a doctor <laughs> and, you know, I had, you know, a, a internship, like a clinical internship and a business internship and the business internship with this startup, like really just made me realize that's what I loved. And, um, and I agree with Mike, like, you know, public health professionals need business acumen. I mean, you, you need that in managing your own business, but um, knowing how to talk to the private sector in language that resonates with them is really, you can't underestimate how important that is. Yeah. Um, um. Sorry, did you uh, call on me? Yes, yes, okay. Gene, yeah. Uh, hi, so I just wanted to ask something about, we, something we talked about earlier about the need for the structural or change in the structural makeup of the system, you know, replacing that rotten cake with a new one. And I really agree with those points. And I guess for those larger changes, some kind of like policy or politicians need to be involved in making those changes, which led me to wonder what the relationship between, you know, public health or health policy thinkers is with the politicians who actually drive those changes? Uh, um, it, it depends, right? Um, I mean, the best uh, public policies, I think, are informed by sort of the, the health in all policies approach, right? Which is that we really ought to be thinking about the impact of health across all policies. And you can see that it's not perfect, but you can see that for example, in the Biden administration now, in the State of the Union, the president is going to talk about pre-K. Uh, um, you know, the, the evidence would suggest that one of the best things we could do for health would be universal um, early childhood education, right? It's clearly one of the best things we could do for long-term health. Uh, and it sits completely outside the healthcare domain, but it would have a huge, it would have, again, as best as we understand from the research, it would have huge implications for the health of the population. So, um, and I think that in the right policy context, uh, this is known. Uh, the, the politicians are listening to the researchers who know this, but as we know, that's not always the case, right? 
And we know particularly now there's a, there's a lot of policy now being developed at the state level and also at the federal level that is kind of devoid of a research base, uh, particularly anything that I've talked about, you know, of the health and all, all policies approach. Um, so it's always gonna be a struggle uh, for researchers to connect with policymakers who are really going to take the research seriously and take it forward into public policy. Gene, can I just add that the, the COVID pandemic has created a real crisis around that question. And many of us in public health and global health are thinking hard about how we can do better the next time in relating and understanding populations because that's who politicians respond to. Uh, and not to go into that in depth, but it's an area that is getting a lot of attention now. And I think we realize it's not simply social media. We also need to think about how to work with community groups. Uh, and of course, how to, as many have spoken about, how to improve our health system uh, across the board, not just public health system. Uh, but I think your question is one that is right now one that we many are going to think about in the next few years. Uh, Rachel. Hi, um, so I'm Rachel. I'm an MPH student at UNC in health policy, um, graduating in May. And um, basically my background um, work experience has been in the nonprofit and academia spaces and like do good education type work. And um, I've transition to policy to increase my impact. Um, and this past summer, I worked at a payer. And uh, my question is about, I know that uh, Michael and I believe Jillian too had mentioned uh, partnering with the private sector and how important that is. And I feel like in my program, I've gotten shame sometimes for um, potentially wanting to work in the private sector. But um, I kind of want to figure out a way and how to incorporate like upstream factors and population health in a potentially private sector job like a payer. Um, so how would you recommend dealing with like the moral dilemma of like the profit, uh, the profit motive and some of the other like controversies, lawsuits, things like that in that industry, but still staying true to your why and like doing the work that that industry has such an important like role in. Thanks, Rachel, for the question. Um, I'm going to answer it in a couple of ways. One is I think that it is just so wonderful that you are thinking about that question and feeling the discomfort as you are following your own passion and curiosity about how you can make the world a better place. So I would say like that alone is all I think any of us can do is really uh, be introspective and critical of ourselves and think really deeply. Two is I'll do another Dr. King moment for the for us like to build a beloved community, which Dr. King talks about. Like everyone is needed, payers are needed. Um, they have an incredible role to play in creating a system that we all want to see. Much of the work I do right now for NC Inc is building this alternative payment model where payments can be actually one day used not just for a fee for service model, but actually funneled into early child care settings. So more children are receiving the type of early education that Susan was talking about that's necessary. So that is a way that you can be thinking about working with the private sector in service of better outcomes. Mostly just like being ethical is all about asking questions and you're asking questions. And I think that's wonderful. Yeah, and, and I, I would just add, look, newsflash, we live in a capitalist economy, right? It's just the reality of how we live. And, and most many countries around the world aspire to have well-developed capitalist economies because look at what has happened over the last, despite all, right, over the last two decades, billions of people have been lifted out of poverty around the world, right? Um, and, and, and not because of anything other than the kinds of forces that are inherent in capitalism. Okay, notwithstanding the pluses and minuses of much of this, right? So we live in a capitalist economy. It has certainly been my experience, every private sector entity that I've interfaced with in healthcare, there are good people inside those walls. There are good people in pharma. There are good people in payers. Is it universally great? No, but nothing I've ever encountered is, right? There are always foibles, but 
um, if, if, if you're going to effectuate any kind of a change, as Mike said, and, uh, and Dan said, and others have said, you have got to understand the forces at work in the private sector, and you've got to engage with them. And if you can be on the inside of those entities and doing good, why would you, why would you pass up the opportunity to do that? Rachel, 25 years ago, a woman worked for me at Yale when I was running an aid center. She had just graduated from public health school. She, uh, she is now president and CEO of a foundation of one of the largest pharmaceutical companies. I am very glad she's in that position because she has the same moral and ethical fiber that you have. And that foundation and that company is very fortunate to have her. And to the extent they've done anything right in this pandemic, she's played a major role in that. I don't want to go into names and all that because I don't think it matters. But but don't let the static inhibit you. You're going to keep getting it. Uh, but as long as you're doing what you're passionate about and you're making a difference in that company, uh, I'm happy you're going to do it. Yeah, I, I would just add, I, I don't think they are at odds with each other. So I might frame it a little bit differently. Um, and and just like at the end of the day, you know, if something isn't sustainable, uh, it won't have impact. So I, I think, you know, you, you don't want to be, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's the advice we give a lot of our innovators. Um, and again, back to, you know, I think knowing how to speak to the private sector, even if you ultimately leave to go to leave the private sector, having that experience knowing how to communicate to private sector is gonna make you so much more impactful um, and, and, and able to apply the business acumen that will be needed to make whatever model you want to be sustainable, sustained. Well, we have come to the end of our hour, but I wanted to thank each of our, our for her panel. Um, I think that there is a huge amount that we can be learning from you. And, um, and it's, it's wonderful to hear and also wonderful to have you sharing with this group. I think it's also a testament to how much that you feel that the kind of this, this next generation is going to help with the problems that, as you said, that we don't yet know about um, and that need to plan for. So thanks everyone for joining and to the students involved. Um, thanks for putting together the Health Policy Week this week. Everyone have a good rest of the day. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye-bye.